Sponsored by Hunter Killer. Yo, and welcome to a brand new format. In this one, we will take a look at disturbing things from all over the world. My previous format, Disturbing Part of the Internet, has been milked dry, let's be honest, and the episodes are getting more and more elaborate and limiting. Either way, I think this format here is a far improved version of the previous format anyway. Not saying that I'll discontinue the format, but I can't rely on that format forever. Also, I made a community post not so long ago about the desire to make a format for regional cases. This format here will therefore also include regional cases from Germany or other countries, some better known and some lesser known topics. Some of the topics will obviously be still mysterious since this is the main theme of my channel. And before we start, do me a favor and subscribe to the channel guys. We are closing in on 150,000 subs, which is just insane. And let's jump into the first case. Man kann es nicht in Worte fassen. Also es war die ersten Wochen schon schlimm, wo man einfach nicht, nichts wusste, die Ungewissheit da war. Und ich arbeite weiter, weil das ein riesen Halt für mich ist, die Arbeit, meine Kollegen, ein geregelter Ablauf. Und so muss es halt irgendwie weitergehen. Es muss irgendwie weitergehen. Ja. You just heard Christian F a guy that went onto a TV show to ask the public for support in order to find his fiancée who vanished. What people didn't know was that he himself had taken her life months before he appeared on the show. This is a regional case that happened in Germany. Christian F. took the life of 26-year-old Maria Bauer. Christian F. and Maria Bauer were a couple. They were planning on marrying. But suddenly Maria just disappeared. She vanished in 2012. Which brings us to the strange part about this case. There was a TV show named Aktenzeichen XY Ungelöst, which is a show that presents cases of unsolved crimes in a dramatic reconstruction in order to solve them. This is a very popular show and I think Germans in my audience should be familiar with it. In one of the episodes Christian F. was actually a guest. He basically is getting interviewed and is an actor who pretends that he is sad about the disappearance of his fiancée and is hoping for public support to find her. Obviously, months before this interview, he had already taken her life. In 2020, he was found guilty and was sentenced to 15 years in prison, which is the maximum possible sentence in Germany. He poisoned the drink of his fiancée and buried the remains in a forest, after he had liquefied the body with an acid. Before we continue, this video is brought to you by Hunter Killer, and I really think that this is a perfect sponsor for the channel. Hunter Killer creates murder mystery games that lets you be the detective. They offer a subscription product, with every six boxes being a new murder mystery case. There are also a number of all-in-one, non-subscription products. With each box, you receive audio recordings, documents, notes, chat logs, video recordings and much much more. Your help is needed for a case, so you can hone your detective skills from the comfort of your couch. It really tells an immersive story. You'll learn about the backstories for each of the suspects, their complicated relationships to the victim, and watch everything unfold as you complete each episode. Overall, I love how challenging the cases are, and it definitely is fun to play, but more importantly, they are supporting the Cold Case Foundation with each purchase you make. So not only can you spend some quality time with your family and friends while playing the game, you also support a good cause. On top of that, you can go to the link in the description box below and use code Eudoxia for $10 off your order. Again, make sure to use Eudoxia for a $10 discount. Thanks again to Hunter Killer for sponsoring this video. Yuka Takaoka, born 1998, was a former Japanese bar hostess who gained massive popularity after committing attempted murder out of love. Yes, I know this sounds insane, but yuka is what people refer to as a real-life yandere. According to dictionary.com, yandere consists of two Japanese words. The first one being yanderu, which means to be sick. The second one being dere dere, which can be translated into a love struck. The word yandere is mostly a fictional term used in Japanese media such as anime and manga. A yandere is often portrayed as someone who is sweet, caring and innocent, before switching into someone who displays an extreme, often violent or psychotic level of devotion to a love interest. In 2018, Yuka was 21 years old and lived in Shinjuku City in Tokyo, Japan. Yuka dropped out of university when she was 19 and worked at a hostess bar instead. During her profession, she also met her victim, 
a guy that goes by Phoenix Luna, who was working in a host bar. Overall, hostess and host bars are places where you pay a fee to interact with the host or hostess. These interactions are officially PG, meaning safe for work. However, it's obvious that there might be things happening behind the scenes. Either way, Yuka and Phoenix started dating, which caused for a lot of problems. See, Phoenix's job was to flirt with other women who paid him, so a conservative relationship with Yuka was quite difficult to maintain. Further, Yuka was obsessed with him, and her obsession grew throughout weeks and months. During this time, Yuka snooped around his phone and found images of Phoenix and other women. She knew that this couldn't have been a regular client, since she went out of her way to buy him out completely. She spent $9,000 on him, so he wouldn't need to meet with his clients. Knowing that he probably cheated, she went all in. Yuka was arrested in 2019 after stabbing Phoenix in her apartment. The final moments before she got arrested seemed, with all respect, very movie-like. She was just sitting there on her phone, smoking while drenched in his blood, as if it was the most casual thing in the world. Sitting in the police car, she can be witnessed smiling. During an interview at the police station, Yuka admits that she loved him so much that she just couldn't help herself. She had to do it and wanted to follow him shortly after. Multiple people online linked her behavior to that of a typical yandere girl from anime and manga. Yuka's Instagram account also contained numerous images of herself in cosplay, including yandere characters. Just imagine the perpetrator being male in this case. He would have probably gotten negative reactions for his actions, probably written off as a crazy stalker, but in this case, there were quite a few positive reactions online. Artists were making fan art for Yuka, even going so far to create a GoFundMe to bail her out of jail. In two days, it raised nearly $4,000. After receiving backlash and mass reports, the GoFundMe was taken offline, and the artists also started deleting their fan arts. In trial, Yuka was found guilty on the charges, but the now recovered victim Phoenix accepted Yuka's apology of 5 million yen, which were roughly $45,000 at the time. Additionally, Phoenix even claimed to hold no grudge against her, and that he is genuinely sorry for cheating on her. He also asked the judge for a lighter punishment on Yuka. In the end, she was sentenced to three and a half years in prison and will be released next year or in 2024, which seems very low for what happened. This case has been labeled as the most mysterious case in Germany. Rebecca Reusch was a 15-year-old who disappeared without any trace in 2019. This will be a long one, so sit back and relax as I dive into this case. Rebecca Reusch was living at her parents' place in Berlin, in the district Rudo. She has two older sisters, both of which are in her 20s. She went to the Walter Gropius Schule in Neukölln. Initially, it was believed that she was always living a happy and fulfilled life due to her parents claiming this numerous times in the media, but as time went on, we got a clearer picture of her. She was struggling quite a bit finding purpose or goals in life. She was also very insecure, constantly thinking about what people possibly thought about her. She has texted her friends on numerous occasions stating that she feels less and less energetic. Arguably, this is what most teenagers go through anyway, but it's important to keep in mind that her life was far from perfect, even though her parents claim otherwise. As for the case itself, it is very complex, so I'll try to go a lot more into detail than what I usually do to make sure that you can follow most of the events that took place before, during and after her disappearance. If you want an even more detailed list of events, the sources are all in German, but there are good articles from Berliner Zeitung, ERND, RTL and Tagesschau. ERND having the most elaborate timeline of events. On the 19th of February 2019, Rebecca was hanging out with her sister Jessica at the house. At around 8pm, Rebecca sent an image of herself to her cousin. At around midnight, her sister went to sleep on the first floor, whereas Rebecca slept on the couch in the living room downstairs. Meanwhile, Jessica's husband Florian comes back from work at around 6am and immediately jumps into the bed next to Jessica. Jessica wakes up moments later to get ready for work and took her daughter with her. According to her, she didn't check the living room to check on Rebecca. 7.15 am. Rebecca's mother calls Rebecca to ensure that she doesn't oversleep for school, but is unable to reach her. She instead calls Jessica, 
But Jessica says that she doesn't need to wake up so early, which reassures the mother. 7.46 a.m. is the last time that Rebecca's phone connects to the router in the house. 8.25 a.m. The mother calls her again to no avail. She decides to call Jessica's husband Florian, who tells her that Rebecca is no longer in the house. 8.42 a.m. The mother texts Rebecca, stating that she hopes that she made it on time to class and that she couldn't reach her. This message had two check marks on WhatsApp, meaning that she received the message, but they were grey, meaning that she never read the message. She also never made it to school, and no one heard about her. So far, everything was pretty clear, but now it starts to get a bit more untransparent. For the following lead, we need to have a bit of an understanding of Snapchat. This is important, since one of Rebecca's friends claims to have received a selfie from her through Snapchat in the morning of the same day. On Snapchat, you are able to record and send images to someone else. The receiver only has a few seconds to view the images before they vanish forever. This is arguably the most important feature of the app. During a police interview, the friend was unable to provide the image to the police, but was able to give a brief description. Allegedly, she was wearing a white hoodie from the Korean pop band BTS, black sneakers, jeans. She also had a camera and a jacket while standing in a room. Which makes this even more convincing is an integrated feature that Snapchat has. This feature will put three flames next to the person's name if they decided to share an image with the same person for three consecutive days. This feature only works with images that were taken immediately, meaning if you pick an image from a gallery, this wouldn't work. This basically confirms that the image that the friend received was indeed from her personally, not from a possible captor. This further confirms that she was alive at the time. Continuing with the timeline, 6pm. Rebecca's mother decides to call the police. The search from the police was extremely elaborate with helicopters, divers, dogs and more, searching for her in the sea, near highways and throughout the entire district for the following weeks and months. There also was a search from the site of family members to find her. There are three total suspects, but we are basically grasping for straws here since there is basically no trace. First one is a guy named Lucas, who was a school friend of hers. Before her disappearance, he and Rebecca had a conflict and that basically made him one of the prime suspects. After an interview from the police, they decided that he was most likely harmless. The other suspect is Max, who is even less likely to be the suspect. The main suspect, however, is Jessica's husband named Florian. He was arrested on the 28th of February by the police. The reasons are as follows. Florian was the last person to be in the house with Rebecca and during the police interview, he was giving contradicting statements. Earlier, he claimed that he immediately went to bed after coming from work, but according to the police, they found chat logs which disproved this claim. He wasn't asleep during this time since he was chatting on his phone. Raising suspicions of authorities, they decide to check security cameras on the highways and streets from the 16th to the 19th of February to see if he was driving his car in the area. There were two matches first one from the day before, around noon, and then on the 19th around 10.40pm, which is obviously the same day of her disappearance. The car was witnessed both times on the A12, a highway leading to Poland. Interestingly, he never made it to Poland, since there was one more security camera which would have caught him if he drove to Poland, meaning he drove to somewhere else. To this date, Florian refuses to elaborate where he drove to. While this sounds very, very shady, there is one more thing to consider. In an interview, the father of Rebecca states that Florian driving on the highway is unrelated to this whole case. The father says that he is unable to say why. Even more mysterious, he calls out Florian by saying that Florian should just say why he was on the highway to finally close his lead and remove him as the main suspect. The father insists that Florian is a good person and that he would never do such a thing. It is speculated by others that Florian was smuggling drugs and that's why he was driving to Poland and he doesn't want to get arrested for it. That's why he remained silent but to this date this was never confirmed. Interestingly, on the 4th of March, Florian got arrested again. The lead detective in this case claimed in an interview in one of the biggest TV shows Aktenzeichen XY Ungelöst that Rebecca's life was most likely taken and that Florian is the main suspect. According to the officer, Rebecca never made it out of the house alive. The police has shared their version of the story, which goes as follows. Florian came home from work, watched porn on his phone, texted a few people, took Rebecca's life, 
wrapped her body in a purple blanket, which also is missing from the house, brings her to his car, drives to Poland to get rid of the body. However, after two weeks, Florian was let go. I think you may now understand as to why this case is as mysterious as it is. None of it makes any sense. Ever since the 14th of February this year, there was no update to this case. Rebecca would have been 18 years old by now, but according to the police, she's most certainly not alive anymore and Florian remains the main suspect in this case. The monster with 21 faces was a name used as an alias by the group responsible for the blackmail letters in the Glico Moringa case in Japan, which happened in 1984 and is considered one of Japan's biggest unsolved mysteries to date. We'll talk about a few theories at the end, but what exactly did they do? It started on March 18, 1984. Katsuhisa Izaki, the CEO of the Izaki Glico Company, which is a Japanese multinational food processing company, was at his home with his wife and three of his children. Suddenly two armed and masked men used a stolen key from the home next door to enter the home. Once inside, they tied up his wife and the oldest daughter, which was seven years of age. After the wife offered the men money, they responded, be quiet, money is irrelevant. Meanwhile, Katsuhisa was bathing with his two other children. He was abducted naked and taken to a warehouse. Three days later, Katsuhisa was actually able to escape, but was unable to identify the perpetrators or provide any other information to the police. This was only the beginning. A few weeks later, the group would set fire to several cars at the company's headquarters in Osaka. On April 16, 1984, a container full of hydrochloric acid was found in a company building as well. Additionally, they sent a letter to his company stating, that they had laced $21 million worth of the company's confections with potassium cyanide. While none of these poison candies were found, it caused damages up to $130 million for the company. Interestingly, they even labeled the food that they supposedly poisoned, so everyone knew that it was tampered with. While all of this is rather physical so far, the interesting part consists of the letters and the blackmailing of the group. And through these letters, we somewhat get a clearer picture of their intention. Here on April 8, 1984, they sent a letter to the police, which reads, To Japanese police fools, are you stupid? There are so many of you, what on earth are you doing? If you're real pros, try catching me. There's too much handicap, so I'll give you a hint. There's no fellows in the Ezaki's relatives. There's no fellows in Nishinomiya police. There's no fellows in flood fighting corps. Car I use is grey. Food was bought at Daiai. If you want new info, beg for it in the newspaper. After telling you all this, you should be able to catch me. If you don't, you are tax thieves. Shall I kidnap the head director of the prefectural police? This certainly is them challenging the police. With car I use is grey and food was bought at Daiai, they mean the car that they used to abduct Katsuhisa and they bought the food in that supermarket. They decide to give out even more information. The next few letters were directed towards the media, mocking the police for their incompetency. The letter here is written in hiragana and with an Osaka dialect, reading, Dear dumb police officers, don't tell a lie. All crimes begin with a lie as we say in Japan. Don't you know that? Another one contains even more information, quote, To police fools, you shouldn't lie. If you lie, you steal. I also sent this to the Koshian police. Why are you lying? Don't hide things. Why are you complaining? You guys are having such a hard time, so I'll give you a hint. I entered the factory from the side staff entrance. The typewriter we used is Pan Rider. The plastic container used was a piece of street garbage. Monster with 21 faces. Well, after these letters, something horrible happened. The group was threatening and blackmailing other food companies as well, and the police were unable to do anything about it for a long time until the police superintendent Yamamoto of Shiga Prefecture passed away by putting himself on fire. He was probably too ashamed of not being able to catch the perpetrators. Consequently, this led to the group's final message. Yamamoto of Shiga Prefecture police died. How stupid of him. We've got no friends or secret hiding place in Shiga. It's Yoshino Shikada who should have died. What have they been doing for as long as one year and five months? Don't let bad guys like us get away with it. There are many more fools who want to copy us. 
no career Yamamoto died like a man. So we decided to give our condolence. We decided to forget about torturing food making companies. If anyone blackmails any of the food making companies, it's not us, but someone copying us. We are bad guys. That means we've got more to do other than bullying companies. It's fun to lead a bad man's life. Monster with 21 faces. This was the final letter of the group. It is estimated that over a million police officers worked on this case throughout the years. Over 28,000 tips were chased, nearly 125,000 people of interest investigated, but to this date, no suspect was ever charged. While the group asked for a ransom numerous times, the intention of this group seemed to be far above money reasons. This seemed like a protest against police incompetency, which got completely out of control. This is confirmable because they stopped with their activity when one of the investigators passed away. They made their point an argument, but at the cost of a life, which forced them to stop. This is just one possible explanation or theory, it could have been way more mundane. Fusako Sano is a Japanese woman who was abducted at the age of 9 by Nobuyuki Sato and held in captivity for over 9 years, from 1990 to 2000. In Japan, this case is also often referred to as the Niigata Girl Confinement Incident. The perpetrator Nobuyuki was 28 years old at the time and severely mentally disturbed. He had a lot of trouble in school and working life and eventually gave up and became unemployed for a long time. He was obsessed with horse races and idols. A few years later, the incident happened. He forced Fusako into his car and told her in the upstairs floor of his apartment in Kashiwazaki, Niigata Prefecture, which is located in the Honshu region of Japan. After she initially went missing in November 13, 1990, a large police search failed to find the girl. Interestingly, only 200 meters from the house is a police station, but the police was still unable to find her for over 9 years. Now, this wasn't even the first time that Nobuyuki tried this. A year before this incident, Nobuyuki spotted an elementary school girl on the street. As he was attempting to grab her and take her away, a friend spotted her and screamed for help. A nearby teacher ran and tackled Nobuyuki and called the police. He was sentenced to one year in prison and then let go. Coming back to Fusako, he had tied her up in the room and threatened her. He said, quote, You can't leave this room. You'll live with me and I'll be here all the time. If she dared to leave, he would take her life. This made Fusako give up completely and accept her fate in captivity. During captivity, Fusako had to endure a lot. For the first three months, Fusako had her hands and legs tied the entire time and wasn't allowed to walk on her own. Any time Fusako didn't answer to Nomoyuki, tried to escape or leave her bed, she was beaten. He even went so far to practice martial arts on her. In the entire time together, she was only allowed to take a bath once when she had fallen and gotten herself dirty. He blindfolded her, stripped her in the bath and bathed her. He only gave her a radio to listen to until the last year of the time together when he let her watch TV. He often used a stun gun on her. She would stun herself at times to get used to the pain. If she forgot to record his horse races on TV for him, she would be punished. She was only fed one meal a day of instant soup or bento box lunches. She would often faint from malnutrition, and her hands and feet suffered from atrophy, making it difficult for her to walk on her own. Interestingly, there were times where she was left alone and the door remained unlocked, but she wouldn't escape. She herself said later that she was too scared, and eventually lost the energy to escape. After so many years, everyone lost hope in ever finding her again, so it came close to a miracle when she was finally found. Nobuyuki's mother was living downstairs for the entirety of these nine years, and claimed to never had seen the girl. The police speculate that she must have had some knowledge that she was up there, since she bought feminine hygiene products for Nobuyuki. Further, the mother was also getting a very similar treatment from Nobuyuki, getting beaten, stung and tied up. And she called the hospital to get help, but no one came. She tried again a few days later and people finally came to the house. They went upstairs where Nobuyuki was sleeping. He woke up and got very upset, but the officials were able to subdue him. This was also the moment when they finally found Fusako. They quickly identified the girl. The mother was never charged, despite possibly knowing of her son's actions. He was sentenced to 14 years in prison. He was released in 2015, but shortly passed away in 2017 due to health complications. 
As for Fusako, she had numerous issues both physically and mentally. She recovered quite a bit, but she'll be scarred for the rest of her life. The police was heavily criticized. Nobuyuki was a non-criminal and was caught one year before for the same attempt at abducting a girl, but he was never even considered a suspect in Fusako's case. Also, the police station was merely 200 meters away from the house as well. Due to the backlash and subsequent mistakes, two police officers resigned in 2000. We reached the end. Thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to check out Hunter Killer, link is down below. If you haven't already, follow me on my socials, links are also down below. Before ending this off, I want to quickly thank the patrons in the Elite and Legend tier, which consist of Amy Stringfellow, Ellen Eberle, Elena Hatcher's mom, Andrew 906, Bodhi, Brian Cave, Brian Ashaf, Christopher, Dennis Greasefire, Diamond X Dust, Digital Capybara, Edgar, Jeb, Jennifer Gilmore, K4S Silver, Malia Schönberger, Malcolm Mart, MG, Momo Duo Nie, Natalie Weston, Nick Castle, Riley Bear, Tequila Mockingbird, Vladislav Koshevi, Welsh Corpse, XXFOHV, 44, Aaron Hubbard, We Jesus, Cherryman666, Chris K, Christopher J. McCulloch, Courtney O'Cold, Krebs Ugen, Dark Sparrow, Dave Birkins, DJ Chest R, Edison A. Jay-Z, Electrocat, Illy Bueno, Ian Wenkmer, Faster River, Findecano Astaldo, Guzo Nana, James Baker, James Cannon, Just Jackie, Kaneki Tobias, Laura Hansen, Lord of the Lizards, Madeline Tanner, Morgoth C, Nicole Eaton, and next sequel, Rick, Santino Sierra, Serene Dusk, Sean Sparks, Shawnee, Sumitra Sarka, Victoria Atkins, William Taylor, and Saphir. I'll see you guys very soon. Goodbye.